Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. The Presidency of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. The Empire has been invaded, and I have the whole of an armed Europe against me. If you persist in your idea of returning to Holland as its king, then the sooner you leave Paris, the better, and do not come within 40 leagues of it ever again. French Emperor Napoleon to his brother Louis, late 1813. On December 15, 1813, Napoleon received word through the French diplomatic corps that the foreign ministers of Austria and Russia, joined by a diplomatic representative from Britain, were offering him a peace treaty if he would agree to evacuate French forces from the rest of Europe and, quote, return France to its natural frontiers. Normally, this would have been unacceptable to the French emperor. His inclination to this point, as we've seen, has been to fight and to be defiant. However, circumstances in the French capital were changing by the moment, and as 1813 gave way to 1814, it was anyone's guess as to how everything was going to shake out. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to welcome you to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Thanks so much to Ben Jacobs of the Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast for providing the intro quote for this episode. In addition to being a fantastic guy and one of the key organizers of the Intelligent Speech Conference, on his podcast, Ben provides great insight into the early modern period in European history. For anyone wishing to understand the trends and revolutions and ideas that ultimately contributed to the American Revolution, you should check out Wittenberg to Westphalia, anywhere fine podcasts can be found. I'll provide a link on the page for this episode, or you can search for Wittenberg, B-E-R-G at the end to West P-H-A-L-I-A. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of the new Medal of Honor podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, brought to you in partnership with the National Medal of Honor Museum. In each three-minute episode, we'll learn about a different service member who distinguished him or herself through an act of valor. We'll include stories from the Civil War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and from all branches of the military. We'll talk about service members who were overlooked for the medal at first due to their race or religion, and about those who were celebrated at the time. We'll hear stories of soldiers like Audie Murphy, future Hollywood star who mounted a burning tank to hold off German infantry in World War II, and people like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a Civil War Army doctor and the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor so far. Learn about these heroes and more wherever you get your podcasts. By the point that he received the peace overture from the Allies, Napoleon had replaced his previous foreign minister, the Duc de Bassano, with Armand Augustin Louis de Colincourt, Duc de Vessons. Colincourt, as he has come to be known in most histories of the time, was favorable to peace, and had at times prior to this stood his ground to the emperor in favor of policies that might have led to a diplomatic resolution of his conflict with Russia, rather than the failed military strategy that Napoleon ultimately took. It is likely through Colincourt's influence that Napoleon gave his assent to a message opening the door to negotiations. By that point, though, things had already been set into motion, both inside France and externally, which would have ramifications. 
The emperor had reconvened the legislative body of France in the midst of the crisis, and on December 28th, in rather of a rebellious move, rather than, quote, calling the nation to unite firmly under its leader, they presented a list of complaints and grievances against the oppression of the French people, demanding guarantees against further arbitrary authority and insisting on the execution of laws in favor of freedom in general, including the free exercise of political rights. Napoleon prorogued the legislature two days later, but the damage was already done. As Victorine de Chastenay wrote later in her memoirs, by this point, quote, the idea of returning to Ancien Regime and the Bourbons began to spread, almost becoming popular. Meanwhile, not having heard a response from the French emperor, the Allied armies continued their march and, quote, crossed the Rhine from Koblenz to Basel. They also, quote, unanimously signed and issued a new declaration that French frontiers would have to be cut back farther to those of 1792, which meant losing a slice of Switzerland, the left bank of the Rhine, including Aachen, and Belgium, right up to Antwerp. On January 31, 1814, Napoleon issued a call, quote, for a general mobilization of the French people. He would ultimately end up with a force of 120,000. Meanwhile, the Allies had secured another member of their coalition. On January 11, 1814, King Joachim Marat of Naples agreed to join the Allied cause. There was just one big problem. Murat had been a marshal in the French Imperial Army and a long-standing supporter of Napoleon from the early days of his rise. It was Napoleon himself who had made Murat king of Naples in 1808, and Murat was married to the French emperor's sister, Caroline. However, by early 1814, Murat, who had been present for the disastrous invasion of Russia, was fearful for his throne, and even his wife Caroline was advocating for Murat to throw his hat in with the Allies rather than remain loyal to Napoleon in order to hopefully allow him to remain in power in Naples once Napoleon was out of power. Meanwhile, the Allied forces, while suffering some losses in skirmishes with French troops, continued in their march to Paris. On January 25th, Napoleon did something that he had never done to that point. He set out under guard to join his army for, quote, his first campaign on French soil, fighting for his nation's very existence. Despite the overwhelming odds against them, Napoleon and his marshals were able to turn back some of the Allied forces arrayed against them. However, with the Allies continuing to advance towards Paris as February gave way to March, the French emperor grew ever more belligerent and threatened to, quote, have tried for mutiny anyone who mentioned the idea of peace to him. Empress Marie-Louise, who had been left as regent in Napoleon's absence from the capital, reported, quote, that we must certainly expect a visit by the advancing allies in a matter of days. What a frightening prospect. On March 25th, an Allied offensive on Paris began. An emergency council was held on March 28th to discuss, quote, whether the emperor should leave Paris with her son or remain here. And it was his brother Joseph's revelation of a letter from Napoleon imploring him, quote, under no circumstances to permit the empress and the king of Rome, his son, to fall into the hands of the enemy. And just before noon the next day, Marie-Louise and the young Napoleon Deuxième were in a carriage bound for the Loire Valley. By March 31st, Allied troops were marching through the gates of Paris. Meanwhile, the Bordeaux region had already proclaimed the brother of the executed Louis XVI as the new monarch of France, and an agent was working within the halls of power within the capital to engineer Napoleon's downfall as he had helped organize his prize over a decade prior. For long-time listeners, if you are missing our old friend Talleyrand, the one-time French foreign minister under the Directory government and then Napoleon's consulate and empire, never fear, he's back in the mix. Talleyrand had avoided an all-out break with the emperor, though he had exited his official role, and seeing the way the winds were blowing, this ultimate survivor had begun a dialogue with the Comte de Lille, as the deposed king's brother was known. Talleyrand was firmly in the Allies' camp when on April 1st, they proclaimed that they would no longer engage in peace talks with Napoleon or any of his family members, as they did not recognize his legitimacy and instead invited the French people to 
to speak their intent through their representatives in the Senate. The next day, Talleyrand arranged for the French Senate to proclaim the emperor to be deposed and issue an invitation to the soon-to-be Louis XVIII, or Louis XVIII, to come to Paris to assume his throne. Meanwhile, Napoleon remained defiant and talked about marching on Paris. His marshals, however, realized that any opportunity to save the empire had come and gone. As they argued with the emperor, he insisted that, quote, the army will obey me. But one of his most loyal commanders, Marshal Michel Ney, asserted that, quote, no, from now on, it will obey only its commanders, us. With no army and no state, there was only one choice to be made, abdication. He had already sent word to Colincourt to try to negotiate for his son to be continued on as the emperor with Empress Marie-Louise as his regent. But at this point, this was a non-starter for the Allies. On April 11th, Napoleon wrote out, quote, and signed his abdication at the palace of Fontainebleau. Though he would be permitted by the Allies to go into exile on the island of Elba, quote, over which he would be granted complete sovereignty, his wife and son would not be joining him. On the 13th, he gave Colonel a handwritten letter to Marie-Louise. Quote, Goodbye, my good Louise. I love you more than anyone else in the world. My misfortunes hurt me only because of the pain they cause you. Love your most tender husband always. Give a kiss to my son. Adieu, cher Louise. All the very best. Napoleon. After giving him the letter, Napoleon, quote, soon became incoherent and then cried out in agony. The emperor for years had kept a vial of poison around his neck, and he had decided that the time had come to kick off this mortal coil. The poison, however, was old and wasn't nearly as potent as it had been. Thus, after a few days, Napoleon had recovered. On the 16th, he wrote to his former wife and empress Josephine, quote, When I go into my retreat, I am going to replace my sword with a pen. The history of my reign should prove to be most curious, for I have been seen only in profile, but I shall reveal the whole. I have heaped benefits upon thousands of wretches, but what have they done for me in return at the end? They have betrayed me. Yes, all of them. Goodbye, my dear Josephine. Resign yourself, as I have had to do, and never forget him who has never forgotten you and never will. Napoleon. This was a seismic shift in European politics and affairs. The first French Revolution, which had begun in 1789, had now been completely overturned. Though naturally, there are many historians who make valid arguments that its end was long before the state. Whatever your thoughts on the matter, 1814 is the incontrovertible end, with the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. For our part in considering this through the lens of the American presidency, let's take some time to get caught up with some of the diplomats representing the United States in various European capitals, starting with the one who, despite being the furthest away from the nation's capital, was also seen as being the dean of American diplomats abroad. As discussed back in episode 4.25, John Quincy Adams, who had been serving as U.S. Minister to Russia since 1809, had been working from the distant post of St. Petersburg to achieve a diplomatic resolution to his nation's conflict with Great Britain. He had managed to secure from the Russian Tsar Alexander an offer to mediate between the two warring powers, and Adams had happily sent word back to his government. However, in the time that it had taken for word to travel to Washington, D.C. and for President Madison to appoint peace commissioners, the British government had received the Tsar's offer and rejected it. The Russians kept trying, But after four rejections in the course of 1813, it became clear that they were unwilling to accept the offer to mediate. That rejection had to be sent to the American government as well, so it's quite possible that British Foreign Secretary Castlereagh's message to his counterpart, Secretary of State Monroe, crossed the two peace commissioners, Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin and former Senator James A. Bayard of Delaware, somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Imagine Monroe's surprise then, when he received a note from Castlereagh expressing a willingness to negotiate directly, possibly at the neutral city of Jotabore, Sweden, 
are in London. Bayard and Gallatin arrived in St. Petersburg in July 1813 with Adams' official instructions as the third member of the Peace Commission. There, they waited. And waited. And waited. One can imagine their frustration at being stuck in the state of limbo with no official news arriving about whether the British were willing to negotiate and with the Russian Tsar being absent, off in the battlefields of Europe and thus unable to consult with them about next steps or to get him to use his influence to move things along. This did not mean, however, that they were completely without news. Soon after his arrival on European shores, Gallatin had written to a friend and close colleague, British banker Alexander Baring, and Baring, in a letter dated July 22, 1813, informed Gallatin that the British government was unlikely to accept anything but direct negotiations as, quote, this is not the way for Great Britain and America really to settle their disputes. It is sort of a family quarrel where foreign interference can only do harm and irritate at any time. Even at that point, Baring was able to inform his American friend that the British would seek either Yotabore or London as the site of the negotiations. While Gallatin kept up a steady correspondence with Baring as an unofficial back channel to the British government, the American commissioners planned what to do. Without new instructions from the Madison administration authorizing them to directly negotiate with Britain, the diplomats' hands were tied, despite their willingness to engage the British. Their instructions clearly said that they were to act with the Russian Tsar as a mediator, a fact of which they reminded the British and Russians. While still awaiting word on what action to take, Gallatin in mid-October got the news that the Senate back home had rejected his confirmation as a peace commissioner. News of his rejection had already started hitting European papers, so on November 1st, he wrote to the Russian foreign minister Count Rymyatsev to confirm his status, but asserting that, though he could not continue to make official communication to him, he had also not received any official letters of recall or instructions of any kind. Even more so than his other colleagues in St. Petersburg, Gallatin was in limbo. He had known that leaving the U.S. on the mission without formal Senate confirmation was a gamble, and it looked like he had lost. Still without formal instructions, Gallatin and Bayard decided that the time had come to leave Russia. Adams, still in the post of U.S. Minister to Russia, would remain. As it was in the midst of winter, and the water passages to the Russian capital were frozen, they departed St. Petersburg on January 25, 1814, and traveled for six weeks by land to Amsterdam. As noted by Gallatin biographer Nicholas Dungan, quote, It was a brutal journey in bad weather and through a great deal of snow. However, while en route, they would finally receive official word from the administration back at home. Madison had appointed new commissioners to negotiate directly with the British. Gallatin, however, was not one of them. We'll talk more about what all went into this appointment process shortly. For now, just know that Gallatin, Bayard, and their party arrived safely in Amsterdam on March 4th, and it would be from here they would decide their next steps. Meanwhile, let's look in on what lately had been a rather ill-fated posting, that of U.S. Minister to France. Just going through the ones that we've covered since the Washington series, Governor Morris was seen as being too federalist and aristocratic for a France at the height of the radical pinnacle of the revolution. James Monroe, while being a rousing success with the French, was out of touch with the administration he was representing and was recalled. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney was turned away without even being recognized by the French government. Robert R. Livingston struggled his way through, only to have Monroe sweep in and take credit for something he had worked on for years, the Louisiana Purchase. John Armstrong had been seen as lackluster by both the French and the Jeffersonians back home and had only proved yet again that he didn't work well with others. Finally, Joel Barlow had literally died in service while caught up in the chaotic French retreat from the invasion of Russia. Enter William H. Crawford of Georgia in 1813, the latest to take up the post. Crawford and his party arrived in Paris on July 24th, which, funny enough, is your friendly neighborhood podcaster's birthday. As we've discussed in this episode, Western Europe at the point of his arrival was in rather of an upheaval, and Crawford, as the only U.S. minister to be found in that part of Europe, had to assume command, quote, of all consuls of the United States in France 
her European dependencies, and Italy, and was instructed to adopt appropriate measures to keep them in strict performance of their duties. Meanwhile, the French government had more on their hands than to negotiate with an American diplomat. And, indeed, by that point, the emperor was far from the capital, and unlike his predecessor, Crawford had no intention of chasing Napoleon across the continent. Crawford's time was primarily spent with two main tasks, lodging protests with the French government of their continued seizure of American vessels, despite numerous promises in the past that they would stop the practice, and writing, quote, long, informative, and quite accurate letters to Secretary of State Monroe on the military and political situation in France and the rest of Europe. Finally, on November 14th, Crawford was officially recognized by Emperor Napoleon, but it quickly became clear that he would be dealing with an unstable government. As we discussed earlier, Bassano, who Crawford had been dealing with, had been replaced as foreign minister by Colin Cole, and so the U.S. minister had worked to build a relationship with a new contact at a time when the foreign minister, as well as the entire imperial government, was more focused on national defense. Needless to say, diplomacy with the United States was low on the priority list at that point. A few months later, a new government was in place in Paris, and Crawford was faced with a new delay. His credentials were to deal with the French imperial government of Napoleon, not the new French royal government of Louis de Huitien. While it was thought both by Crawford and Monroe when he heard the news that their prospects to get recompense for American losses at the hands of the previous government were greater under the new Bourbon regime than they had been with Napoleon's government, it would still take time before Crawford could actually do anything to that effect, as the Madison administration would need to send new credentials and instructions. Thus, we'll leave Crawford waiting in Paris and return back to D.C. to learn more about the new peace commission that Madison had nominated to deal directly with the British. When the administration learned that the British wished to enter into direct negotiations, Madison without question decided to agree to the offer, but took a second look at the commission he had sent previously. The president decided that it was important to keep Adams and Bayard on the commission, but it seems like he had second thoughts about Gallatin. It could be, as Gallatin biographer Dungan asserts, that, quote, Madison had assumed Gallatin would come back to Washington to resume his duties as Secretary of the Treasury. Thus, he looked around for other options. Madison felt that the Federalist Bayard's pro-British stance would have to be countered by someone like Adams, who was a strong nationalist. He quickly settled on a new candidate. Henry Clay had certainly made a name for himself since his arrival in Washington in 1811 and being elected Speaker on his first day as a member of the House of Representatives. As described by historian Robert Remini, quote, not only was the Kentuckian a leading nationalist who could be expected to fight for American rights, but he was an outstanding and loyal supporter of the administration. Though Clay had no diplomatic experience at that point, Given the authority that he had cultivated in the previously inconsequential office of Speaker, it was certain that Clay would be a presence to be reckoned with at the negotiating table and in the deliberations of the peace commissioners. While Clay was a bit reluctant to give up his position in the House, he also asserted that he felt he could not, quote, decline the duty which the government has been pleased to assign me, although it is full of responsibility. As a fourth commissioner, Madison turned to someone he had previously tried to appoint unsuccessfully to a diplomatic post, as discussed in episode 4.27. Jonathan Russell, who had been the last chargé d'affaires in London when diplomatic relations had broken off between Britain and the U.S., had the year prior been Madison's choice for U.S. minister to Sweden. At that point, the Senate had argued that having a minister in Stockholm was not needed. But now that it looked like the negotiations might be moving to Sweden, Madison saw a way to get Russell into the permanent posting, as well as add his experience from his time in London to the work of the commission. The nominations were confirmed by the Senate, and Clay resigned as Speaker on January 19th. The question remained, however, of what to do with Gallatin. To be fair, Gallatin had gone to Europe knowing that it probably meant the end of his career in public service, as he was so despised by the anti-administration Invisibles faction in the Senate that he was unlikely to win confirmation to another cabinet post. As Madison was putting the finishing touches on the commission, his hand was forced to replace Gallatin at the Treasury with George Campbell, as discussed last episode. Thus, the president accepted the political reality 
and instead, on February 8th, decided to appoint Gallatin as a fifth commissioner to negotiate directly with the British. This time, the Senate agreed with Madison's choice and confirmed the nomination. We'll be talking much more about the work of this five-man commission in future episodes, but we'll let things rest here as our time together is drawing to a close. Thanks again to Ben for providing the intro quote for this episode, and please be sure to check out Wittenberg to Westphalia wherever you get your podcast. Special thanks also to Christian of Your Podcast Pal for his audio editing work on this episode. Christian has been great to work with over the years, so if you're looking for assistance with editing your podcast, check out what services he provides at yourpodcastpal, all one word, dot com. Thanks to the folks at the Colonial Music Institute at George Washington's Mount Vernon, who graciously allowed us the use of clips from Hull's Victory, as performed by David and Ginger Hildebrand, for our intro and outro music. You can find out more about the great work that the Colonial Music Institute is doing to research and share information about early American music and dance by going to mountvernon.org and typing in Colonial Music Institute in the search field. If you'd like to see the sources used for this episode, explore resources available to learn more about all of the U.S. presidents, or learn how you, yes, you, dear listener, can help support the podcast, check out the website at presidenciespodcast.com. If you sign up as a patron on patreon.com slash presidencies, you'll get access to an ad-free feed as well as other perks. And thanks so much to all of our patrons for your support. If you'd like to reach out to me, feel free to email at presidenciespodcast at gmail.com. You can also find me on social media. I'm available on Facebook, Post, Mastodon, and Blue Sky as Presidencies, on the formerly known as Twitter at Presidencies89, and on Instagram and threads as Presidencies Podcast. Last but certainly not least, I thank you so much for listening. If you like what you've heard, tell a friend. Word of mouth is likely how you got connected to the Presidencies Podcast, so why not invite someone else to join us on this journey through presidential history? Until next time, stay safe and healthy, be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.